uh, for today's session, we have a conference and a talk titled uh, Telling Dance Bridge Analysis. And today we are going to take advantages of the virtuality. Uh, we are going to have one of our speakers here in person in, in the room, and the other one is in Calgary. So that part of the lecture will be completely online. So in this presentation, a uh, telling that bridge analysis, TDBA, is a critical aspect in the assessment of the potential impacts that a telling containment failure may, may have on surrounding community and the environment. These analyses are more often being required by regulators as part of the approval for designs of tailing contain, contain and structure. This is to ensure that the risk posed by such facility is appropriately characterized and that the mine owners have appropriate emergency response, ERP, and emergency preparedness plan, EPP, in the event of a hypothetical failure of the dam. PDBA has evolved over the more recent decades, and it's no longer just a regulator box to be checked. As a public pressure for the responsible management of this facility grows in the, in the wake of recent tailing dam failures throughout the world. TDBAs have traditionally been completely on, way, on water container structure, but additional care must be taken such that, that the analysis can more appropriate account for the hydrodynamics, geotechnical, and rheological consideration inherent in telling release. This presentation will provide a high level review of current practices in TDBA for telling storage facilities, including telling mechanism, failure modes, release volume estimation, DAO street routing, recommendations, and current reach on further improving these analysis. So as I told you, this presentation has two speakers. Uh, today with us here in the room is Mr. Scott. He's a geoenvironmental engineering training with Bar Engineering based in Calgary, Alberta. His expertise is focused on tailing and mine was disposal with a particular focus on Canadian's oil, sand, and potash mining industry. His work includes, but it's not limited to oil, sand, tailing technology development, novel approach to tailing the water, large strain consolidation, numerical modeling, tailing containment structures, mine closure, and reclamation planning and land for design. Scott has completed a bachelor in mining engineering and a master in geoenvironmental engineering in 1917 and 2022, respectively, both from the University of Alberta. He has co-authored several conference papers on the use of novel techniques on oil sands, tailing the water. Heat. And virtually, our second speaker is Mr. Hossein. He is a senior water uh, resources engineer and project management with Bar Engineering based on Calgary, Alberta. His expertise include, but is not limited to hydraulic and uh, hydrology and hydraulic analysis, river and coastal engineering modeling, pollution dispersion in water bodies, water and telling dam bridge analysis, food, uh, yeah, fluid hazard studies, shoreline protection, mine water management, the site of hydraulic structure, computational fluid analysis, business development, ADCP, and RTK measurements, and GIS. Hussein completes his PhD and master's degree in water resources engineering in 2021 and 2013, respectively, both from the University of of Ottawa. He has been teaching as a sessional instructor at the University of Ottawa since 2020. His research, his research publications includes a paper on TDBA in the Journal of Mind Waste and Environmental. And that you can find the link for that paper in the email with the invitation. So please join me welcoming our both speakers for today. 
Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I know Hossein's got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to try to go through my stuff really quick. Again, this conversation is going to be on tailings dam breach analysis, um, which we'll get into defining some of why we as geotechs should do care and be aware of and how to better inform our hydrotechnical colleagues for when they're performing these analyses. I did want to start the presentation with a land acknowledgement, um, both for Edmonton and Calgary, given that we here are in Edmonton for the University of Alberta and Hossein, as well as my home office, is located in Calgary. In Edmonton, it's located within the Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, as in Calgary, located within Treaty 7 territory and within the homeland of the Northwest Métis and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We want to acknowledge the land as by their traditional as their traditional territories and the many communities that comprise uh, the First Nations in these areas. Getting into our specific presentation, uh, a general rundown of what we're going to talk about today. The first is the why of TDBA. Why do we do it? Why do we as geotechnical engineers uh, need to care? And how do we better inform our hydrotechnical colleagues in terms of their analyses? I'm going to provide kind of a brief overview of what tailings are for those who are geotechs outside of the tailings world. Um, some of the properties and rheology that are relevant to these analyses, as well as this will primarily be based on a summary of Section 5 in the recent 2021 CDA Bulletin on Town Tailings Dam Breach Analysis, which, again, Hossein will get into in greater detail, um, and then he'll go through and discuss um, a little more background, failure modes, um, the actual process of analysis, computing release volume, breach modeling, downstream routing, and he'll also make some comments on future research and continuing work that needs to do to further inform these analyses. So the why of TBDA, what is a tailings dam breach analysis or a tailings dam failure? Tailings dam failure is what you might expect. It's defined as a physical breach of the dam, um, generally unplanned, followed by uncontrolled and typically sudden release of any or all of the stored materials. Um, this is critical to informing dam consequence classifications. Those who are familiar with the world uh, of tailings and dam storage, uh, most of these consequence classifications are not only based upon the size or quantity of tailings that are being stored, but also what is the consequence should such a failure occur? What are the communities affected? What is the magnitude of the people in those communities? What is the environmental impacts? And the only way to really do that is to have an understanding of should a failure occur, what would the impact area be and what does that relate back? Um, in Alberta specifically, and most jurisdictions in the sort of Western world and mining communities, there's regulations that require emergency response plans and emergency preparedness plans. Again, those who aren't as familiar with those can check out the Alberta Dam and Canal Safety Directive where there's additional guidance, um, but those focus more on should a failure happen, how do we react, who do we notify, how do we minimize impact to the environment and people. Getting into what are tailings for those who don't work in this world, um, in the most basic sense, tailings are a waste product and they are the result of processing mine doors to get something valuable out of them. Um, the properties of these tailings, they vary dramatically for a number of reasons. This can be the properties of the source ore, which could impact gradation, mineralogy, um, the process used to extract the components. So a metals mine or a heap leach is gonna have very different tailings to an oil sands mine. Um, and then any treatment that is done on those tailings before placement, were they mechanically dewatered through centrifugation or um, filter press, or were they just placed, were they dosed with chemical flocculants, all of those impact your properties of tailings as they're deposited. And then the last piece is just that properties of tailings not only are as they are as they come out of the plant, but they also evolve based on how they're deposited. So is that a subaqueous or subaerial, meaning basically above or below water? Um, it, what is the consolidation behavior of these materials? What is the drainage conditions? And also how old is the deposit? We have tailings facilities that have had tailings in them for decades or almost parts, parts of a century. How does that, that behavior can be very different than tailings in a fresh facility? Um, this again is meant to be very high level because you can do many presentations just on liquefaction um, and I'm not gonna get too far into that. But what I want to impress upon this group, particularly as geotechs is, what is critical to our investigations in regards to how we inform our hydrotechnical colleagues for their analyses. So um, as you've heard a million times, a robust geotechnical investigation um, is generally mandatory. It's already something that's done, but it's important when you're looking at it to inform a tailings dam breach analysis, what are the additional potential information you need to know? What does that mean? How do you interpret the data? 
Um, so this usually includes, you know, standard laboratory testing, CPT testing, um, but how you interpret that can be slightly varied based on what you need that data for. And the main thing that we're focusing on here is the potential for these tailings to undergo a flow liquefaction, which is critical to these tailings dam breach analyses. This is critical in order to estimate how much volume of materials is actually going to be released and what are the characteristics of that flow. Uh, a general rule, and this is taken from the CDA guidance, and again, any geotech who's an expert in this will say, well, it's not that cut and dry, but the general guidance is that you should assume that a saturated tailings that exhibits contractive behavior under a shear um, should be assumed to experience this full liquefaction, all other things being equal. However, again, it is not a replacement for professional judgment or adequate geotechnical investigation. So it also doesn't take into account any changes in densities as a result of evaporative losses, mechanical compaction. As you've heard a million times, there's always a million things going on. And we as geotechs have to be aware of how those different things inform and impact the results that we're presenting. <clears throat> so let's assume it flows, materials liquefied, what is that flow behavior? Well, this is falling in now into the rheological realm where the definition of soil mechanics and fluid mechanics becomes very, very blurry. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges with tailings is that they tend to exist in this world between us as geotechs with our soil mechanics and more of our water-based colleagues who are much more on the traditional fluid mechanics side or conventional fluid mechanics engineering. So, you know, the idea behind getting appropriate rheology and rheological assessments is if this liquefaction occurs, what is the behavior of those liquefied or released tailings? Because it's not as simple as just a water containing dam, which is what previous dam breach analyses have been performed on. So these materials, they exhibit very different behavior, non-Newtonian flow behaviors, meaning that, you know, shear is very, or rather the, uh, their properties are varied based on their shear. Um, Behavior is not consistent the whole time. So you might start with one rheological property and it might be very different by the time you've hit the run out. Um, so this rheological characterization is really the most critical part because as Hossein is going to get into, um, these are the values that are put into his models in order to assess what the actual flow characteristics and impacts of such a dam breach are going to be. This slide was meant to just highlight a few additional sort of further considerations. Um, with regards to this, number one being that liquefaction potential can change dramatically. So something that you've off, you've probably heard if you've been working with anything with liquefaction is what is the trigger mechanism? And something to realize is that um, a trigger mechanism isn't always something like seismic activity. It can also be the actual failure of the containment itself. When that dam breaches, the tailings within are going to undergo stresses that are different than what they are in a static state. And so tailings that may previously have been identified as non-flowable may actually become liquefiable and flow out of the dam. And this is a critical part to sort of defining it. So we as geotechs are familiar with undrained shear strength, and this usually governs that initial failure, but the behavior changes as the tailings flow out of the facility. So these controlling forces are still largely dependent on sort of solids content and void ratio. But what's interesting is that these change over time as the um, tailings flow out from the facility in the case of a dam breach, um, those concentrations actually change. And what I wanted to highlight on this slide is these are two plots, um, one showing viscosity versus what's called concentration by volume. And the right is the, um, <clears throat> is well, it looks like they both got copied in the same way, but um, the idea being that on the bottom in geotechnical terms, we generally focus on mass. So we talk about solids content as it applies to the mass fraction of solids within a given material. However, in the in terms of dam breach analysis, as Hossein will talk about in greater detail, hydrotechnical people look at it as a volume concentration of solids. So what I wanted to highlight here was just, it's important to recognize that who you're talking to, what the values are gonna be used for to make sure that the model you're creating is representative because a model is only as good as what's been put into it. If you put in bad data, you get bad data out. So again, one final note is, you know, that these slurries, they may be governed by sort of these viscous forces, but the issue with tailings is that at higher solids concentrations, fluid, conventional fluid mechanics isn't as good at defining the behavior simply because um, as your concentration of solids goes up, these solid components interact with each other more. So you start to needing to go into the more complex areas of uh, continuum mechanics to define 
how those interactions are now governing the flow characteristics versus when it's a more fluid like and Hossein's got a couple of great slides showing actual visual representations of what this sort of transition can look like. And so we'll get to there. So the final thing for me before I pass it off to Hossein is that ensure that we're doing proper geotechnical characterization and keeping in mind the rheological considerations as well. So not just looking at, okay, well, we don't want it to fail as geotechs. Of course, that's not what we want, but should it happen, what does that mean? Um, so ensuring that we have Appropriate rheologic variables for the flowable tailings is critical to producing a representative model that can adequately that can adequately assess the impacts of a tailings dam breach. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Hossein. I just need to change the screen here really quick. Hossein, can you share your screen, please? I am going to share my screen. Yes. Can you see that? Good. We're good on this side, Hossein. Okay, very good. And you guys can hear me good? good. Yes? Yes, we're good on this Perfect. side. Perfect, awesome. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you, Cole, for <laughs> inviting us to talk about this. And uh, I transition a little bit here, and uh, thanks to Scott for the great uh, introduction to the, uh, to the topic here. On my screen, what you're seeing here is uh, a few of the past uh, dam breaches, uh, historical dam breaches, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, background on uh, tailings dam breach assessment, TDBA. So unfortunately, we have numerous cases historically of tailings dams failures. And uh, for example, in China, 1962, Okudu dam uh, failure resulted in the release of 3.3 uh, million cubic meter of tailings and uh, resulted in fatalities of 171. Later on, for example, in Italy, 1980, the volume was much smaller, the release volume, but the still fatality was quite high, 268. And more recent uh, in Brazil, Bormidinho dam failure, release of 12 million cubic meter of tailings and fatality of 267. I have listed only six of the events here. Uh, there are quite a bit of them, unfortunately. And these are the ones that had the highest fatality rates. Uh, for example, here in Canada, Mount Polly is uh, another example that resulted in, um, in severe environmental impact downstream. And this list is unfortunately long. And uh, throughout the presentation, sometimes you will see this uh, useful links block underneath of each slide. And uh, I put these hyperlinks that are clickable if, uh, if the Geotechnical Center decides to uh, share the PDF of the presentation, can be clicked and takes you to the websites. And uh, this list is taken from the uh, Wise Uranium project. And on their website, they have uh, actually an up-to-date uh, list and chronology of the uh, tailings dam failures and with some useful information in terms of like release and the impact downstream. And the image on, uh, on the screen here is from the uh, El Cobre Dam Bridge in Chile in uh, 1965. And this is actually from another database that is from the Can Bridge uh, Research Group. I will talk about that a little bit. And they have also uh, uh, compiled a, uh, an inventory of the historical breaches with some uh, aerial imageries and useful, useful data. Again, uh, there is a link here and that's clickable uh, to take you to that uh, database. I talked about uh, Bormodinho uh, that, uh, that happened in 2019 and uh, I am working, uh, you know, from bar engineering. We are working with the uh, University of Alberta on uh, on a publication, joint publication. And what we are actually doing there, uh, as part of uh, that publication, is that we are creating a new database uh, linking the uh, the satellite imageries from the historical uh, breaches, uh, mostly from the uh, Planet Lab. And uh, uh, as you can see, the top image here is from the Planet Lab. And linking that basically to the uh, to the Wise Uranium uh, website or 
data that they release uh, on, on that database. And uh, in this event in 2019, the Bormidinho breach happened uh, around this location here. And you can see clearly on this image, the downstream impact of this. And it goes quite a bit downstream. It travels up to like beyond seven, eight kilometers downstream. And the impact definitely was severe in terms of environmental and loss of life. So now that I guess brings this question that uh, what, uh, what industry is doing in terms of responding to these uh, failures and how in particular mining, mining industries uh, is responding to this. I, uh, I, 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 I say mining industry, but, but in reality, I mean, that's a, uh, all the stakeholders, right? That, that, that are involved or impacted by this, that, that will include basically uh, mining industry, mine owners and consulting engineers, public and regulators. So uh, it, it's basically a big stakeholder that we are talking about here. But mining industry uh, took the lead and took, took the action. And uh, they basically uh, uh, started working on, uh, on guidelines. And uh, I think they realized along with all other stakeholders that uh, tailings dam breach assessment cannot be uh, treated uh, as, as a regulatory box to be checked anymore. And uh, this is beyond that. And you know, the energy and thought and effort should be, uh, should be put to do this properly. And uh, in 2021, a Canadian Dam Association uh, released the first technical bulletin on tailings uh, dam breach assessment. And it was uh, welcomed and uh, well received by the industry worldwide. And for example, uh, another uh, example is the tailings management handbook that was released last year actually. And they had uh, a section on this uh, that was published by SME. SME stands for uh, Society for Mining, Metallurgy and uh, Exploration. And uh, so we are seeing even, you know, internal guidelines by mining companies and mine owners on uh, how to do the ta tailings dam breach assessments as well. And uh, we also see the uh, regulatory and uh, other bodies releasing uh, these guidelines. And uh, as Scott briefly mentioned, uh, I will be uh, referencing the CDA uh, quite a bit in my next slides and uh, we'll be discussing about that uh, it. So now with that, uh, I think, uh, you know, after, after gathering uh, the data that is required for the uh, TDD, TDBA, uh, a combined effort maybe by hydrotechnical, geotechnical, and other discipline is to come up with the uh, plausible failure mode uh, for, the, for the dam breach assessment. And in CDA uh, guideline, they identify three basically general failure modes for uh, tailings dam. Collapse of foundation due to you know, applied forces that can be because of earthquake or other mechanisms. And uh, uh, basically liquefaction that is triggered by earthquake or uh, other mechanisms or surface erosion, piping and internal erosion. And the second one is uh, overtopping. Of, uh, of water basically over the crest. And this can be due to uh, insufficient freeboard or uh, you know, settlement of the crest or you know, insufficient uh, spillway capacity or spillway man malfunction, or even uh, it can be like misoperation as outlined in the, in the CDA. And finally, contaminated uh, seepage to the environment. And, uh, and as you notice, uh, you know, under each of these three categories, there are uh, multiple causes that, uh, that can define basically under, under each category here. And uh, in, um, in a paper that I co-authored in 2020, we looked into historical dam failures and we looked into uh, 85 cases. And uh, we uh, plotted basically the uh, distribution uh, of the uh, of the failure modes. And as you can see on this pie chart here, uh, 
Overtop uh, liquefaction is leading by 22%, overtopping 19 and the slope in stability 19%. And then like when you look at these three, uh, that basically include 80% of, of the 85 cases that we uh, looked at in terms of the failure mode. And uh, in terms of uh, coming up with the, uh, with the failure scenarios, uh, uh, there are two common hydrologic conditions that, uh, that are considered for, uh, for the failure scenario. And they are fair weather, also known as sunny day and uh, flood induced, uh, also known as uh, rainy day or wet day scenarios. I personally don't like sunny day term because it can be a fair weather or it can be basically a cloudy day, right? Uh, which is considered a fair weather, uh, not necessarily a sunny day, uh, but they use that uh, quite a bit in the industry, uh, but I prefer fair weather and, and flood induced terms uh, better than the other. And then in terms of the, uh, the physical processes, the, the physical processes of, of, of tailings, uh, dam breach here, uh, we, should, we should, I think, uh, uh, mention or ask that what is specific to tailings dam failures compared to uh, you know, traditional water retaining dams. Uh, one is, as the name suggests, is tailings, right? Uh, in the tailings dam breaches, we are dealing with the mobilization of the tailings and uh, run out characteristics will be different because here we are talking about the hyper concentrated uh, type of fluid, mud debris flows, or what we would call as non-Newtonian type of fluid versus uh, Newtonian type of fluid for water dams. And uh, of course, bridge shape and dimension uh, could, be, could be quite different in uh, tailings dam breaches versus, uh, versus water retaining dams. And tailings dam breach processes are very complex and not really fully understood uh, up to date. Uh, and, uh, you know, we come up with some simplifications and assumptions to, to tackle this complex, basically, uh, processes. So we often can do or look into this as uh, two, two processes. Process one can be discharge of the supernatant pond that carries, you know, a road and carries tailings and dam field materials. And then uh, process, process two can be the discharge of global tailings due to tailings liquefaction or progressive basically slumping of unsupported tailings. In the CDA guideline, they have this, uh, this, this graphic here, this figure, and they categorize basically the, uh, the, 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 the failure cases into, into four cases, four different cases on the, on the vertical axis here. That's uh, the presence of, uh, of supernatant pond. If we have supernatant pond, which is this blue water here shown on this uh, figure on the top row, or if we don't, and the horizontal axis here is uh, if the tailings is uh, liquefiable or not. So for example, uh, in uh, case 2B, we are talking about a case that uh, there is no supernatant pond and uh, the, the tailings is non-liquefiable. And basically we are dealing here with uh, slumping type of failure and uh, a slope basically failure, which is mostly, you know, a geotechnical type of analysis that we are dealing with rather, rather than hydrotechnical. And unfortunately to date, there is no tool that uh, to, to correctly and properly, you know, represent both processes and, and model both processes for us. That's why uh, we often do again uh, simplifications and assumptions. And uh, 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 on this slide, I guess uh, what I'm trying to show here is that uh, assume a case that uh, supernatant pond is, uh, is quite large. And uh, in that case, maybe one could use process one for estimating the mobilized tailings and total volume of runout. 
uh, versus assuming that there is no supernatant pond or that's quite small or very far away from the dam. And in that case, maybe process two can be used to estimate the uh, mobilized tailings and total volume. Or another approach or another alternative would be combining these two. So instead of modeling or analyzing this very complex uh, uh, processes of uh, running out of this outflow that is exiting in the case of dam breach, we basically combine the, uh, the tailing solids and water retained during the breach basically to, to come up with a single sediment water mixture and, uh, and basically consider that as one single entity that is exiting the breach and, uh, and, and consider that for our uh, breach outflow hydrograph. That brings us to uh, estimating the uh, release volume, tailings release volume. And this is quite important and uh, probably uh, one of the most challenging you know, tasks in the uh, TDBA. And uh, we start often uh, doing a geotechnical analysis and uh, Scott actually uh, mentioned this in, uh, in his slides that uh, to determine if the tailings could uh, liquefy you know, due to uh, dam failure or not. And uh, assuming that it does, then, uh, you know, we estimate the volume of liquefied tailings from the uh, breach geometry, basin geometry, and the geotechnical analysis that we do. And we also have to estimate the uh, volume of eroded tailings as well, uh, that is caused mostly by the water rushing out the, uh, the breach uh, opening and also Again, geometrical characteristics of, uh, of our basin, uh, which is unique from basin to basin, and also the geotechnical data and analysis. This, this graphic here, the top view is uh, the, the plan view that we are looking at. And uh, in case of a liquefiable tailings and uh, failure of the dam, uh, there is this area in front that represents the liquefiable tailings. And then behind that, is the area of, of eroded tailings. If you look at this in cross-sectional view, you see that uh, when the failure happens and uh, tailings is liquefied, basically, we get a plane of liquefaction here and we get this initial nick point. And as the water is rushing out, it's eroding tailings more. And uh, basically this, this surface here in between is representing uh, the, the eroded tailings uh, up to a point that we get to this final nick point. And to show this maybe uh, a little bit better in different stages, uh, again, under a liquefaction failure, uh, this is our pre-liquefaction that uh, the, the dam is intact and you have your tailings and uh, pond, supernatant pond off the stream. And, uh, and then uh, basically the deformation uh, starts and it results in settlement of the dam crest. And uh, at some point, uh, the dam crest settles below the water level uh, in the tailings basin. And uh, that's, that's when basically the sheet flow over the uh, deformed surface uh, happens and uh, going, going out. And uh, with further, basically, the formation of the dam, more water flows over the uh, deformed surface. And erosion of the uh, surface uh, basically will start if the flow exerted shear stress exceeds the, um, the critical shear stress of the uh, surface materials. And at some point, it gets to an equilibrium, uh, basically, deformation, uh, and the flow rate uh, uh, May, may, may reach to its, uh, its maximum and peak. In that uh, paper uh, that, uh, that I mentioned that uh, I, I uh, co-authored in 2020, um, and there is a link actually here uh, to access that paper, uh, in the uh, Journal of Mine, Water, and the Environment, we mentioned that there are a few methods uh, to estimate that uh, tailings uh, release volume. There are simplified methods, uh, which are 
statistical like regression uh, methods based on the historical tailings dam failures. It started uh, with Rico and colleagues in 2008. And then later on, other researchers and uh, authors basically added to the database, or sometimes they have uh, divided the type of uh, the, the, the failures, uh, historical failures based on the type of uh, tailings material and other characteristics and came up with different sets of equations. There are quite a bit of them. And uh, there is another, for example, method flowability approximation or method by Fountain and Martin in 2015. And that's basically uh, considers two, two main uh, tailings properties, density and uh, specific gravity. And uh, the concept of it is that uh, of, of tailings assumes that uh, as a solid concentration in a fluid increases, the flowability will, will decrease. And uh, in that paper, we uh, looked at a, a few uh, uh, failure modes, uh, slope instability, overtopping, and liquefaction, and uh, looked at some historical cases where we had the uh, reported tailings volume, and then tried to apply different methods uh, to come up with the breach, uh, breach, uh, breach volume estimate. What I was talking about just before this slide was uh, mostly a geometrical app approach that I was showing. And uh, in that paper, we use that geometrical approach and also empirical, which are the um, regression equations as well as flowability. And uh, you can see that there is quite a bit of difference between methods as, uh, as shown here. And then the next step basically in terms of doing the uh, TDBA after estimating the uh, tailings release volume, which is a challenging task, uh, then the next task will be basically uh, uh, breach modeling itself. And uh, breach modeling basically will identify the shape of the breach hydrograph and its peak. And there are three general uh, methods or models uh, available to do that. Uh, parametric models uh, basically predict the breach parameters uh, such as breach average widths and breach formation time or time to failure and hydrograph shape and its peak using the regression analysis. And uh, again, these are based on historical dam failures. And most of actually these parametric models and formulas that, that have been developed are based on water retaining dams. And uh, on, on my screen, I'm showing, I guess, uh, how many of these, like six of these models from uh, a, a document from HR uh, Wallingford here, uh, done by Best and colleagues in 2018, a guide to breach prediction. There is a link here to that, uh, to that report. They have actually be a bit, very big appendix, uh, including probably more than 20, 30 different parametric models that li they listed. And uh, the other type of models that, uh, that we have are semi-physically based models. And uh, they often take uh, breach geometry and formation time uh, to generate the breach hydrograph. Uh, these models will ignore uh, the physical processes, but uh, uh, rather use some simplified fluid dynamic equations such as VR flow equations to uh, estimate the breach hydrograph. And finally, we have the uh, physically uh, based models and these models will actually model the entire processes, the physical processes of erosion of the embankment and, uh, and, and the, uh, the material basically uh, off stream. So, and uh, in, in that paper uh, in 2020, we did a comparison between uh, two semi-physically based models, uh, HECRAS 2, 2D and Flood Wave uh, versus a one parametric model, which was HEC HMS, to see how different they are. And as you can see on, on this plot, uh, the two semi-physically based models uh, are predicting basically our peak and the shape of hydrograph quite, quite, quite similar and different than uh, the parametric model. And uh, we, uh, I think the implication of this difference will be in the downstream routing, right? When we route this hydrograph downstream in terms of velocities and depths, inundation, uh, they will result in different uh, basically downstream impact. More recently, actually this year, uh, 
uh, we looked into the one of the semi-physical uh, uh, base models, uh, HECRAS 2D, as they uh, recently released this non-Newtonian module. And uh, we said that, okay, let's compare the uh, Newtonian versus non-Newtonian hydrographs. And uh, again, the, the, the models here are exactly the same. We are using the same volume or a stage of storage curve in the HECRAS model. And one is uh, running under Newtonian fluid condition with the Newtonian module. And uh, we looked at two non-Newtonian cases, one with low viscosity and one with high viscosity. And we didn't see uh, a meaningful difference here. Um, and this may suggest that, uh, you know, semi-physically based models are not really capable of, uh, you know, uh, modeling that complex processes of tailings dam breach uh, formation and release as, as mentioned before. And uh, again, that the model is very, very unique in terms of like geometry and volume. And uh, the difference was uh, non-Newtonian versus, uh, versus Newtonian. All right, uh, we get our breach hydrograph and then the next step for us in terms of TDBA will be the downstream routing. And uh, Scott briefly talked about the uh, concentration by volume and viscosity and yield stress. And uh, this graph again is from a uh, CDA guideline. And what uh, what's showing is the uh, sediment concentration by volume on the horizontal axis against the sediment concentration by weight. There's actually a formula here to relate them uh, based on the uh, specific gravity of the sediment or tailings. And uh, so what, uh, how we categorize or uh, come up with these uh, uh, outflow classification or outflow regimes is that under 20% of CV is considered as, uh, as water flood or Newtonian type of fluid. And then beyond that, it's a hyper-concentrated uh, outflow or non-Newtonian type of fluid. For example, from 20% to somewhere 45 or 50%, we are talking about the mud flood and then mud flow. And finally, beyond 60% CV concentration by volume, we are talking about the landslide uh, type of breaches. And uh, there are quite a bit of tools available now uh, uh, in terms of doing the downstream routing and modeling the uh, tailings flow and, uh, and non-Newtonian basically type of fluid. And uh, you know, from HEC RAS to flow 2D, flow 3D, flood wave and other models, river flow 2D. There is actually one, uh, one research that was published last year from the uh, Cambridge research team on uh, you know, a benchmarking study of, uh, of four numerical models. I believe they used uh, Flow2D, Flow3D, Dan, and another model. And there's a link again here uh, to that study. CDA also uh, looked at uh, briefly on the uh, modeling tools available. And they listed a few, uh, several models actually, and uh, looked into the characteristics of, of those models. For example, if they are able to model those four cases that we showed or not, and if they are capable of doing two dimensional modeling or they are only one dimensional uh, or three dimensional. And uh, also if they are capable of doing both or one of these Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. And uh, finally, some, some insight on, uh, on the computational costs of running these models. In that uh, 2020, 2020 paper, uh, we looked at actually two models, uh, Flow2D and Flow3D, and we ran basically a hypothetical case uh, of a TSF uh, failure, dam failure, and uh, in, uh, in those two, two models, we kept basically everything the same in terms of you know, the release volume and uh, numerical details like uh, grid size for downstream modeling also and uh, like roughnesses for the downstream um, 
area as well as uh, rheology uh, parameters like uh, viscosity and yield stress, which are the, the two most important parameters in terms of uh, running basically the hydrograph downstream. And uh, as, as you can see, the, uh, the inundation extents are quite different in this case. And uh, that's something, something to, to keep in mind and note when we are evaluating the models and uh, in interpreting the results later on. And uh, with that, I come to uh, some, some recommendations and uh, we look at a couple of uh, ongoing research here as well. Uh, in terms of recommendations, I guess Scott emphasized on this, I do as well, uh, data, data, and data. Uh, we need to uh, pause at the beginning of these studies and uh, evaluate what, what the objective is of that study and then make sure that we, we collect enough data to achieve that, uh, that, that objective or objectives of the, uh, of the study. And uh, that's, that's quite important. Again, uh, we don't uh, want to exhaust necessarily all the resources to come up with the data. Sometimes we really don't need a centimeter, you know, topographic information and uh, maybe a two meter uh, resolution uh, will, will suffice. But sometimes you need site specific, maybe rheology uh, available and send people to collect that data. And these studies are multidisciplinary and uh, I cannot emphasize enough on, on, on this because in reality, I mean, sometimes, you know, a hydrotechnical or geotechnical person can say that, oh, I can do all of this. But in reality, that, that starts way back, right? Uh, from field technicians, let's say on site collecting data, you know, we have our geotechnical, hydrotechnical engineers working along with maybe tailings specialists. We have not talked about uh, downstream inundation mapping where GIS staff and colleagues will work on uh, producing those maps. And uh, also dam consequences cla uh, classification is often needed. And uh, to do that, we may need uh, colleagues from you know environmental and you know ecology specialists and uh, and so on and the third bullet point as scott said uh, i like this uh, this uh, this bullet point here all models are wrong but some are useful and it's really important as i was showing in the previous slide that uh, difference in uh, in inundation extent and that that suggests that when we are dealing with such uncertain and complex processes, always uh, keep in mind doing on, uh, sensitivity analyses. It can start from, it basically starts from, uh, from the beginning, right? When we are developing the bridge parameters, uh, let's say bridge fits or time to failure or rheology of the, uh, of the, of the tailings, uh, mainly viscosity and yield stress. And then while, when we are routing that downstream for uh, roughness of the, uh, of the downstream area or the mesh sensitivity tests. So that's, that's quite important. And uh, finally, saying up to date, uh, you know, reviewing the, uh, the, the, the recent research publications, papers, and keeping basically ourselves uh, up to date. Uh, there are quite a bit of research actually going on, and I'm personally very happy to, to see that. And as I follow recent publications, there are quite a bit of uh, research going on. I mentioned Cambridge uh, a few times, and uh, I, I believe I never asked, but Cambridge, I think, CAN stands for Canada, and BREACH is BREACH. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that project is led by three universities, University of British Columbia, University of Waterloo and Queen's University. And that's partially funded by NSERC and, uh, and, and industry partners, Imperial Oil, uh, Suncor and three uh, consulting firms, BGC, Golder and KCB. UBC is doing the numerical modeling aspect and uh, Queen's is doing the physical modeling where you see a picture here from that team of doing the physical modeling of tailings dam breaches. And, uh, and Waterloo, I guess they are doing some uh, statistical and uh, field level uh, analyses. For example, here at BAR, we are working with the uh, University of Ottawa at the moment uh, on, on the topic. And I'm pretty sure that other universities and entities are working on, uh, on this as well. And uh, regardless, I guess, of, uh, of the role, if we are working as consultants or 
you know, uh, mine owners or any other stakeholder on this, uh, people are keeping, you know, their mind open and uh, sharing what they are finding. And that's great uh, with, the, uh, with the entire society. And I put also a link here to the Cambridge website where you can see the, uh, the publication and what's going on there. I will stop here and uh, hopefully I didn't uh, talk much, uh, much here. And uh, with that, I guess I uh, open the floor for some questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Hussein and uh, to Scott for, for this presentation. Now we have the question session. Uh, there is any question in the room before we start with the questions online? Okay, so wait me. Your name and the question. Thank, thank you very much. So, can you move forward? Thank you, uh, Nick Byer from the U of A. Um, how do the models handle heterogeneous tailing deposits? Do you be able to assign variable properties to that whole mass that's flowing out, or do you have to assign sort of one single rheology uh, for the whole mass? Okay, so uh, it's got. Uh, do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, because so, it's related okay. to your model. Okay, uh, so if I understand question, um, question was that if uh, we can assign a variable, you know, uh, properties to the mass, uh, or that's a single property. Uh, to 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 best of my knowledge and our model capabilities, how we do that is we assign a single, uh, basically, value. And, uh, but what happens is that when the routing starts, let's say that we have this breach outflow volume and hydrograph that we developed and we assign, uh, let's say concentration by volume CV, rheology uh, parameters like viscosity and yield stress. As the routing starts, the downstream on the, uh, basically on, on each mesh cell, let's say downstream in the hydraulic model and each time step, those parameters get updated basically. So you are updating the, uh, the, the, the parameters as they are flowing down a stream, but at the, at the breach moment or at the breach point, basically that's one parameter that, uh, that is assigned. Uh, just, just to mention something else, maybe re somehow related to the, to, the, to the question in the chat, uh, we talked about CV concentration by volume and some testing that Scott talked about. Often we do the sampling and uh, from the tailings uh, on site and do the testing and uh, come up with the uh, concentration by volume. But what happens is that imagining that we are talking about cases 1A and, uh, and I believe 2A uh, on the top row where we have the supernatant pond, what happens in case of a breach is that the tailings will mix with the uh, with the water, and what happens is that 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 process uh, will will drop our our concentration by volume. So concentration of volume that we usually use for downstream routing is lower than the tailing concentration by volume. Again, if we have that pond presence there. That answer the question in the chat a bit as well. Um, the short answer is I, I think that's too much of a stretch to make that assumption, um, but based on what Hussein said as well, um, it, it's more complicated than that simply because the, the tailings actually change from that in, initial behavior as they liquefy is going to be variable as they then flow out. And even more so um, if you have a supernatant pond where all of a sudden you're actually mixing as the breach occurs and the outflows happen. Um, so short answer would be no, um, based on our, our overall assessment. Um, and that just further highlights why the rheological behavior um, should be considered as variable because it very much is. 
Okay, I'm going to read the question just to be record so the people that want to or they after can know what was the question. Thank you. The question in the chat was there is a challenge in drawing a parallel between the real life behavior of the parents in the uh, in the current of the legal action. We perform a real logical characterization test for different solids content or CV when modeling. Will it be correct to say that the that the liquid fight that the liquid fight tennis will behave like a sample with lower solid content, or should the real behavior of the same as solid content be considered? That was just the answer that Hussein and Scott uh, provide. Okay, there is another question in the room. We have a consideration and question, like a follow up question that is probably the product soil. Will you consider appropriate to calculate a rest angle? May use the liquefied and share uh, and drain share strength of the soil mass and use an assumption that the tailing below this surface will not run out. I also wanted to know if you have any guidelines on how to select neurological parameters for telling in the liquefied state. Hossein, do you want to comment on that first as it relates to your modeling? Like how, how have you traditionally seen the parameters been selected? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can uh, start on this and then pass it to you, Scott. Uh, the first part is that, uh, yes, as I was showing on that, uh, that slide, the plan view and the section um, where uh, we have, uh, and again, I, I mentioned that uh, these processes are quite, quite complex and we come up with simplifications and methods to, uh, to best estimate these. And uh, we come up with that plane of liquefaction and that's where we assume that our uh, liquefied tailings would, would stop. And then beyond that, that's mostly erosion processes uh, governing the uh, release there of tailings. And uh, that's a geotechnical tailings analysis in terms of uh, estimating that plane and the degree of liquefaction there. Uh, and uh, and then in terms of the uh, most important parameters, uh, rheology parameters uh, in the liquefied uh, state, uh, I can talk about the uh, routing uh, to downstream that, as I mentioned, the, uh, the testing that we do in the lab and use that for routing of that uh, breach downstream, uh, the most important ones are, are viscosity and yield stress. And I also mentioned about like 20% uh, kind of being the uh, uh, threshold there between Newtonian versus non-Newtonian, but we also know that uh, maybe from 20% to 25 or 30%, the viscosity impact, you know, is more important than yield stress. And as you go beyond that, uh, yield stress would, would govern. But uh, yeah, uh, Scott? Yeah, I think Hossein, you covered most of it. I'm just rereading to make sure, but I, I would say that it's not generally appropriate for the same reason that related back to Dr. Byer's question with regards to it, you know, the rest angle of which material for a number of reasons is that one, it, most of these deposits are more heterogeneous. So are you computing the rest angle for the weakest material, the strongest material? Um, the second part of that being too is as soon as you introduce the fact that maybe you have a super Dayton pond or similar, you're also introducing other mechanisms such as erosion that can further impact that to where a rest angle could maybe under or overestimate. Also, your loading conditions have changed if you have a large mass that has now been providing, you know, back pressure or back um, stress on the on the tailings can then obviously that's where it comes down to these breaches can cause non liquefiable tailings to become liquefiable um, is more what I'm getting at. So, but it's probably something worth looking at a little deeper as well. But I think it just comes back to the big challenge is how do we pick and relate rheological parameters? And certainly how do we bridge the gap between these materials as defined by soil mechanics and as they move into fluid mechanics? And the middle ground is 
you know, you start to get more into those quantum mechanics and you're dealing with the um, like critical state mechanics is a better way to analyze when you're hitting that transition zone. So hopefully that answers the question. And I think they're going to close it. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for, for the time presentation. It was great. Uh, thanks for having the time and, and being here. And we wait for see you all the next week with a presentation about equity, diversity, and inclusion in geotechnical engineering. So thank you very much. Thank you.